Tenacoto Katoa, my name is Joel Colon Rios, and this is episode two of the Lives in New Zealand Public Law series. Today we have the honor of talking to Professor Tony Angelo. We'll talk about his early um, life and education, about his work in the Pacific, and his views about comparative law and self determination. Tenacoe, Tony, thanks very much for being mm. with us today. Yeah. Yes. You're uh, Joel. Thank you. So, in, this, in these interviews, you usually try to start from the beginning. So um, can we can 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 we um, hear something about your early life and, and education and what were your interests back then? Right. Um, well, I was born not far from here, uh, the early years of the war, so in in Newtown, and um, then um, my mother and I were evacuated to the Wairarapa. And uh, my first school was Castle Point Primary School. Then after the war, uh, we returned to Karori and uh, all the primary education was in schools there. And, and at that time, do you have any, did you have any sense that you would, um, at some point in the future, decide to um, study law, or I understand that, that I mean, your, your, your early um, studies at the university were in modern languages, so mm. were you already direct going in that direction, or did you have your mindset in, in the study of law, do you think? At, at uh, point def definitely you? not. Mm. Um, the, there were no uh, professional people in the family. Mm. Uh, both parents had come out of the depression penniless, and then there was the war. So, um, no, I had no predisposition, but um, I can remember late in primary school uh, feeling an interest for the merchant navy. Mm. And um, one, one teacher there who was ex-merchant navy said, you're not the type. <laughs> no, don't do that. So um, I don't remember what happened next, but I went to college and did languages. So the university entrance was English, Latin, French, and German. So that's the beginning of the language. Yeah. And then um, at some point, um, before becoming a, a, a law academic, I suppose, you um, also entered the national Ballet of, of New Zealand? Yes. Um, I'd been um, involved in the theatre from, I don't know, seven years old. My first job was in the theatre. I got paid as an extra uh, with a touring opera company. Um, which was good fun. Uh, it, of course, was late night work. My mother had great difficulty keeping me awake for when I was supposed to do my bit. Um, and par part of that training had been acting and, uh, and dance. So that when I got to university, I'd already... Um, Yes, I'd already reached a teacher diploma level in, da in ballet and I set up my own school and that was what paid me through the law degree. Interesting. <laughs> Good. And, and, and did you, so, so, so you, you already knew you wanted to, to study law at that point? No, no. Um, Counselling at at, this, at school, um, the closest there was to any suggestion was um, the clergy. And uh, that didn't strike me as a, great, um, as a great future. I wanted to do language. And um, my father um, didn't think that was at all worthwhile. So I went to what in those days were called uh, vocational guidance. Um, and the um, person there said, um, what are you going to do with language? 
Um, there are no jobs. Uh, how are you going to look after your family? So you, you, need, um, you need something that will earn money. And um, maybe because of the language, I think he suggested law, which of course pleased my father greatly. And um, the compromise was I did a double degree. I did uh, quite a reasonable uh, French, Italian, Latin BA, a disastrous LLB, and um, and then my plan was, having done the law, uh, to um, uh, do masters in in Italian, and that could only be done at Auckland, so. Um, went to Auckland and inquired, and the uh, professor who would have been the um, mentor or supervisor was going on sabbatical. So I came back to Wellington, and um, belatedly I applied, or planned to apply for a, a scholarship to study dance abroad, but I actually missed the deadline a bit, so that was sort of off the cards. So then I came back to university and thought, I'll do an LLM. And that was a wonderful year. And and the results picked up and uh, really for the first time I understood law. You know, how there was a system, it wasn't uh, just little bits. Yeah, So and so that was it. And then what do you do after that? Um, there's this great thing called comparative law, which involves language and law. So off I went. Excellent. Yeah, so that's how it happened. Excellent. And, and then, then um, and I think this happened after concluding, completing your LLM, you, you um, two did some years travel, in Europe. Two, two years in Europe. Can mm. you tell us a little bit about, about um, that? The first... Um, six months, I think. I went to University of Madrid and did um, um, an immersion course for foreigners. And, um, and then I started, well, I was waiting for the next academic cycle. I did the Hague Academy in, um, that would have been that summer, what, 66 maybe? And then there were two comparative law institutes. One was fixed and the other was an itinerant uh, body. And uh, I w attended both of them. The first one was, I've forgotten its name, but it was in an old castle in Luxembourg. And the dean was uh, a Professor Chloris of London. And, and that's interesting because I met him, and the work I've done in Seychelles was following his work. Mm. So there was uh, that vague uh, link. And then the Strasbourg Academy was much, much, much stronger. And there was um, uh, Professor David, uh, Professor Hazard, uh, Knapp, uh, all the big names came during the um, their recess periods, and um, and there was also a professor Blanchevin, who um, at that time I think was Professor X en Provence, but he later went to um, to Paris, and um, his classes were about mixed legal jurisdictions and uh, how do you deal with civil law and com common law in the same place and I got chatting with him and then he said oh you must go to Mauritius or Seychelles but he he had taught in Mauritius um, an extension course from uh, Exxon, I say, and um, 
uh, sorry, Aix-en-Provence. And um, I think he married a Réunionnaise. So he'd spent quite a bit of time in the region. He knew it very well. And um, so when, when I finished there, the question was how to get to Mauritius or Seychelles. Um, I spoke with the Mauritius uh, High Commission in London. Um, Seychelles you could only get by boat, which was, you know, involved weeks mm. on, on a steamer. And, and of course, weeks both ways, even worse than COVID. And um, so I ended up, uh, I got appointed here. Uh, it was originally a temporary position yeah. mm. at the end of 67. And, um, and then at the end of 68, I got research grant to do research in Mauritius the following summer. And I was there maybe three months and did my thing. And then um, the next thing I knew, they invited me back to do things for them. And, and we will, we will um, definitely come back to your work in Mauritius and, and Seychelles. Um, but you, you mentioned that year, 1967, when you um, um, first, I think, taught at this um, faculty. Um, uh, well, I was appointed late in the year. So I started in, um, well, I was appointed in December and started immediately because we, um, uh, and uh, Dame Allison Quentin Baxter was on the staff and she was in charge of first year law, law, law Laws 101 legal system. And they, uh, that was a relatively new program and uh, she was in the throes of editing the case book which in those days was done still hot lead press and who proofed it. And, and um, so I was immediately um, tasked to work with her with the proofreading. And we spent the summer basically proofreading. But then with the teaching I taught in that course, you know, the same thing, a first year course, and, um, and I taught comparative law. So this was 1968, and, and how was your experience teaching that course? Because I think it was the first time that comparative law had been taught in a New Zealand university. And I yes. wonder how, how did students react to it? How, how, how was it to teach such a course? Um, I, I, I think very well. I have no uh, recollection of, of um, discontent or anything. The, I think that was the first year when um, the faculty had really opened up optionals. The degree I did was a compulsory degree and uh, it was basically still part-timers. By 68 you were getting more full-time students and there were five optionals introduced so there was a recruitment pattern, there was comparative law, criminal justice, um, uh, I think it was called planning law, instant international institutions. I don't remember, the, I think there were five. Anyway, so the, I was one of about three who at that time were recruited for the optionals. Comparative law had a, had a, a role the same as Others, um, it, it, if you like, was the flavour of the month at the time. So there was, uh, I think, very supportive atmosphere and um, there was a leading commercial scholar, exceptional scholar, Professor Ellinger, mm -hmm. here at the time and he was designated my mentor and he knew uh, German law very well. Um, 
and um, yeah, we um, collaborated, or he he watched over me. Uh, so so there was support at the uh, at the highest level. Um, yep. At that time, say uh, early seventies, the um, what, the, the feeling about Japan and things Japanese was rather similar to, I think, greater now than with, say, China. Mm. Um, and um, so, so more and more people were learning it. Um, there was a, a lot of trade. There was um, also a lot of Japanese money coming to support libraries and research. So the future was um, Japan, um, and I um, had, if you like, a, a three-part course. One was basics of comparative law, and then another uh, aspect, private law aspects of the civil law tradition, primarily France, a bit of Germany, and then a third was Japanese law. And the, the main resource for me was Noda's book. And um, it became apparent that it was very useful. And uh, I thought we should have an um, English version. Um, Noda is a very eminent um, scholar in Japan and, uh, yeah, a polyglot and knew as European classics. I mean, he was exceptionally, an uh, exceptional man. And um, so when I wrote to University of Tokyo Press, they said yes. Well, first of all, Noda said yes. Then uh, the press said yes. And the book's gone through many... It, it's a evergreen rather than a current text. And... Um, Professor Noda had uh, been invited to give an introduction to Japanese law at the University of Paris. And the book that was published were, were his French lectures. Um, it's pretty clear that his French was better than mine because when we met, we spoke English. <laughs> But um, so, so I translated from the French. But it was interesting because um, the book uh, is very much informed by things Japanese. Well, it's about Japanese. So um, in some cases where I was unsure of what the French was, I made inquiry about the Japanese and then sorted it. Yeah, so at, at points it was a few points, almost a three-way thing, uh, having to go back to what his Japanese thought was to, then to understand the French expression. And then, of course, we had it for the class. Interesting. Thanks very much. And, and now I would like to come back to Mauritius and and Seychelles. You already talked about um, spending some time in, in Mauritius. I understand um, one of the main things you you have done there was your work on the, or is your work on the consoli consoli consolidation of the laws of Mauritius. And I wanted to ask you um, how, how because this was early in your academic um, and professional yes, career, yes, really yes. how did you approach that task? How, how did you organize yourself? What, what did you do in order to to um, deal with the task you were given? So, so I was there, um, uh, I, was, I, I was in residence for two years, uh, 72, 73. Uh, anyway, it might have been, no, 72, 73. And, um, but I was there every year from 68 through uh, till um, not all, 
always with the government, but latterly uh, with um, private publishers, but um, through till 2009. So it was a very long uh, relationship. Uh, Mauritius was independent in 68. And when I first arrived, it would be like November 68. They were still in state of emergent because they, there was an emergency, um, uh, basically racial division, um, uh, emergency at the time of um, the, the lowering of the one flag and the raising of the other. Um, the Queen didn't come. Um, and the, um, I think my first few days I was in the capital city, a curfew at night, so everything was shuttered and black. Um, but uh, occasionally there were riots and um, I had a very basic hotel and um, it happened that the room next to me, there was an American missionary. <laughs> so uh, we got chatting and he said, oh, it's a good thing you weren't here yesterday because um, it's typical tropics, there were windows, but they're mostly open. And uh, this hotel was immediately opposite the, the biggest mosque and there'd been a riot and he said the tear gas drifted up into his room. So he said, yeah, you avoided that. But it was, yeah, um, someone from here, mm. it's rather different. And um, yeah, yeah. So the the work, the, they, the key thing is they were newly independent. They, um, they are talking about the government really. Uh, very proud, very nationalistic, and very um, keen to to stand on their own feet and be Mauritius, not British. Uh, so they and their law, their, and I'm talking here about legislation, had not been uh, consolidated or reorganised since 1945, and then. Uh, un actually unsuccessfully. So they wanted a complete review of all their legislation. They wanted it to be uh, tested against the Constitution. Uh, it independence, the British just left what was there. So the adaptation, there was no, no work on that. Um, and um, because some of the legislation dated back to the revolutionary years, uh, there's one that amuses me a little bit, uh, or did amuse me. It was called, um, it was a, a decree of 10 germinal year 12. And, um, and the, so germinal, they had everything, the months were for the seasons. And, and what was the germinal? Midwives. So I thought, anyway, so it went right back to there and they wanted then and everything to be in modern drafting style. So you can imagine there was uh, pre-revolutionary French, more modern French, there was um, English conveyancing style uh, drafting. They wanted it all done in as a modern collection so um, the first task of course was to find what is the law there was no list and um, I think spent one summer on that and produced a consolidation as um, 9,000 pages and that was all done on full scap wax sheets that I mean, that's the era. There were no computers and no photocopiers. And um, in the course of that, we discovered that there was a lot of non uh, dead law. And 
1972, there was, I think, a 90-page act passed with corrections, uh, correction of errors and minor amendments, like a statutes amendment bill. 90 pages of, if you like, rubbish got rid of. And um, so we had this collection, um, and that was, of course, then the source for everybody. Um, then it was apparent, of course, what was wrong with it. And um, there was a lot of uh, law reform taking place, um, uh, industrial relations, unions, and um, uh, because of the sugar industry, that was one of the big ones. Um, and then beginning opening up for tourism. Um, so then having got the, the, the laws, the question was then to do the modernization. And uh, in 74, there was another statute which repealed, I think, 250 acts. So it was still clearing. And then, between then and 91, uh, about 600 odd statutes, we r basically rewrote them all and um, some re replaced them. Uh, and then that 91 collection was enacted. So that put a you know, clean break with the past. And um, it was a very nice local printing job. So, um, yeah, something for them to be proud of. Um, yeah, so that was uh, find it, slash and burn, then pol uh, polish and titivate. So, yeah, quite a... At, at the end, there was... Um, I had a staff of 40 work. Well, it was all the proofreading, you see. It's a big job. And was the staff uh, Mauritius-based or...? No, they're all Mauritian. All Mauritian. Uh, almost from day one, I had... Um, well, I started with a, a solicitor, an attorney, Avoe, a solicitor, a government solicitor, worked with me when we were doing the finding part of it. Um, that was good because he knew the system and um, and then once we started putting together the consolidation I think had maybe eight typists still the two of us with eight typists and then um, when we got to proofing the there were a lot of people in the Electoral Commission, and what do they do when there's no election? Mm -hmm. uh, so they were um, seconded to the mm -hmm. Attorney General's office, and um, they were usually paired with a lawyer in the Attorney General's office. So th they had the, um, the copy holder and the reader, and, the, and also someone who They'd uh, come and say, hey, Tony, this, this is nonsense. Um, or did you, are you aware of such and such? Yeah. And but, it, but there was a major commitment. And if I said we can't do it, we're short of staff, the next morning there was staff. Yeah. <laughs> it was good. And, and how would you compare that work with the work you have done um, since then in Seychelles? Um, it's quite both similar and different. Um, one thing that was one thing that was done um, in Mauritius, particularly after my uh, direct connection with the government in the around in the 90s maybe I don't know in the mid 90s 
their law reports hadn't been done for years. So uh, my, my, the, my boss in the Attorney General's office, he moved into private practice and he got a contract to do the law reports and a digest. And I worked with him and a former Chief Justice on those. So there was a five-volume digest which followed uh, 20 years. We did backlog 20 years of law reports. And um, we also did uh, 97, I think, a digest for Seychelles because um, my boss, the Mauritius pr provided Court of Appeal judges for Seychelles and the ex-Solicitor General was a candidate and he'd go up and he'd say, there are, you know, no, um, there's no digest, there's et cetera, et cetera. So he said, let's do one. And he, he had access to the copies of judgments. So um, 2009, I thought, oh, that's my last trip to Seychelles. I was tying off some ends and I thought I'll do a side, this was a sabbatical, I'll do a side trip and have a look at this little place. Um, and of course, big airport there now. And um, um, I yeah, went and met a leading Seychelles lawyer who I happened also have earlier met in um, Mauritius and I, I said oh by the way how'd the digest go oh he said absolutely marvellous but he said the problem has been out of print for years and I said any interest in upgrading it updating it yeah yeah but who's going to do it I said well I, maybe me w would you be supportive so he and another senior barrister said yep we'll pay local if you get here we'll pay your accommodation and give you a car. And um, so that was early, by the end of, towards the end of 2009, the university break, I was back with research assistants and thought, oh, this is a sort of known country. Uh, first thing found, there'd been no reports for more than 20 years. <laughs> How do you make a digest without decisions? So um, we thought we've got, there was a local lawyer contracted to do the reports, but nothing much had happened. Um, and then uh, look around in the Supreme Court Library, a building, a room about this size, no complete set of the legislation um, and what was there, you take a book and the key pages had been removed. Well, the last major collection was loose leaf. Well, the easy thing to do is... Mm. So I, n I never saw a complete collection. So I thought, hmm, we're working on the... Um, on the legislate on the reports that was the goal but then decide how can we do that without knowing what the law and so um said immediately to provide a, a finding list a, a list of legislation in force and um about the same day that i arrived there was a new chief justice from uganda common lawyer and um, so I thought I'd pay a courtesy call it was like his first day in the office uh, the acting CJ had given me the access and so on I said well here I am and he said what are you doing and I said well I've naively come to do a digest and now find there's no law reports, no access to legislation. So I'm going to um, I'm going to make a legislation list. And he said, uh, 
report to me at the end of the week uh, what you've done. So I went at the end of the week and I, with a little machine, um, sort of photo, yeah, photocopier, I think, in the library, we made our draft list and he said, oh, this is a lifesaver. Because um, he didn't know the legislation either, and uh, by that time he was having trouble. Um, I think the um, local lawyers were playing him a bit, mm. you know, uh, because he was very dependent on them. Mm. So um, I think we've, I don't know, nine, ten, eleven editions of that, which is every, everyone used it. Um, otherwise they were just living on their fat. Um, and then we did the reports. We've done over, to, we're up to, last we've done is 2019. We've just finished. We brought them up to date. Um, two sets, the Standard and the Court of Appeal. Um, and um, because of all that involvement, they decided that Professor Cloris Civil Code it was time to bring that into the... They were getting the nationalistic spirit in 2010, 2010, that Mauritius had on the dawn of independence. Um, so they thought we'll look at the, um, the code and um, asked if... Um, we, I mean, I was always with research assistants um, in, um, in Seychelles always from here. Uh, Mauritius was there, but um, so we were in fact the secretariat for the civil code revision. Um, and what the British did as a gift, this is, hmm, well, I'll give you the facts, you can make your own assessment. But just before independence, they said, oh, your civil code, which is in French, um, wouldn't it be nice if you had it in English? So they got um, Professor Cloros, he came and he did an English version very fast. And that was promulgated um, right at independence. And in general terms, it was a translation of Napoleon's Code of 1804, which they'd had. So um, the, the big, uh, Cloris did some reforms based on the French law reform proposals, which at that time were going nowhere but which the French implemented in 2016. Mauritius got some of those in 1975. You know, uh, for instance, uh, Causa, cause, uh, Chloris got, it had been recommended in France, but they only got rid of it in 2016. So um, there were things like that, and he introduced some common law elements um, but basically it was still the, um, I suppose, 18th century France. I mean, the code of 1804 was, of course, <laughs> from an earlier era. Um, so this time round we um, made some major, major changes. And that was promulgated in January this year. But it isn't in force. So you just, because as we prepared it, it had consequential amendments, saving provisions and transitional provisions in the same bill. Parliamentary Council at the time said, no, we don't do it like that. Uh, we'll have a separate bill for the consequentials, the transitionals. Then, of course, you're coming to election period and 
um, change of regime in Seychelles. So they got the, the assembly got through the code, but the other bill was sort of left till the last and they ran out of time. So the code can go nowhere really without that uh, complementary legislation. So fingers crossed that um, it, should, it should be a walkover, but um, th there are controversial things in the code. So if there's any um, second thoughts, that would be a simple way to um, s stop those reforms. First, I wanted to ask you how how did you develop an interest in in the in the law of small states in the Pacific? You know how I mean we are in the Pacific that must have mm -hmm. to do with it. But but um, how did that happen? Um, very very easily um, because I was involved with Mauritius, and it's a small state, so uh, foreign affairs and uh, Sir Kenneth. Or they'd say to Sir Kenneth, know someone who knows something about small states. And, and uh, uh, so the link was a small state, which is, I think, a valuable link, but it's um, probably not the right one, you know, given the cultural and uh, his historical differences. So um, it started with Tokelau, and I mean, Instead of 9,000 pages, there was more like 100 pages of legislation. Um, and that was in 80 or 81. And also had a stint in, um, Solomon, in Solomon Islands about the same time. Um, in 1976, the, um, the UN uh, Decolonization Committee had visited Tokelau and uh, at the end of the visit, th there was a report and there was an agreement with the New Zealand government that they would um, uh, try to, um, or that they would um, identify the Tokelau laws and um, do something about the legal system because, well, Tokelau was living by custom. and. Um, so then, in uh, uh, 1980, the five yearly visit's about to happen again. Uh, the ministry looks down at she and says, oh my gosh, we said we'd do that. And I was given the job. So I uh, spent a summer with a research assistant in the um, parliamentary library. It was, much of the material was in uh, old gazettes, um, either uh, of Western Samoa or um, Fiji, the Western Pacific High Commission. And um, we constructed a, I think, a reliable statement of the laws. And then um, about two years later, uh, we started, a, a say, very small scale by comparison with Mauritius. We started revision, repeals, um, filling gaps. And um, by the 90s, um, we'd ba basically got a tidy system there. Some, some reform, but mainly tidying uh, for, for instance, and this affects many countries, if you extend, the, for instance, the Marriage Act to Tokelau or Niue, that is based on English um, religious ideas about incest. And so uh, you can marry a first cousin. Well, in Tokelau, at fourth cousin, it's okay. Third tolerable. Second is incest. So they had a law which they didn't um, follow, but in theory, uh, first and second cousins could marry, and that for them culturally is incest. 
And um, so those sorts of things, we'd go through, you know, we spend a long time. They'd say, what is, what is it, this law thing? And we, they say, well, you can't marry that person. So then we amended it to meet the cultural um, the cultural um, expectation. So that, yeah, we did, as I say, culturally totally different and um, um, small community, so process different, but the, the exercise was the same. Find the law, slash and burn, then adapt and modernize. And how did you did you learn about uh, say say Tokelau for example? Um, how did you go about learning about the culture of a place that perhaps you you didn't know much about before? The, the, uh, well, I have to read a lot. I did that for Mauritius to you know get a sense of what the local what knowledge they've got. Uh, in other words, you're talking to them. Uh, you need to know what's the background to what they're saying. Um, so happily uh, for Togolau, there was um, uh, two Auckland anthropologists were the, they were the leading people and they had published quite a bit. So I read, I read that. And there was also um, early 20th century, um, I think probably anthropologist did a, a quite a uh, yeah a very good study of Tokelau and, and the University of Hawaii and um, so yeah there were accessible materials but um, yeah anthropologists and lawyers are um, uh, not on the same wavelength all the time but um, their material was very good for me I I, I think the um, goodness knows where they will end because the the two referenda um, didn't um, result in any change of status um, but interestingly for the government of course the, the transfer of power in preparation assumed an outcome really uh, when the outcome didn't happen it didn't undo all the uh, you know, transfer of power. So um, legally the result is that um, Wellington doesn't have a, a, a lot of control over Tokelau, uh, even though it didn't self-determine. Um, I think the, the big difference there, and maybe a little bit, um, I mean, they know nothing of Mauritius, but that, that local spirit um, Tokelau was, uh, when they were discussing options, attracted to the Samoan pattern of autochthony, which of course wasn't the case with Niue or the Cook Islands. So, um, yeah, they, they wanted it to be theirs and they wanted to take control. So the, the, um, the starting point was really different. Um, in the self-determination documents, the key document, um, it went through, I think, 32 iterations. And um, wherever it started, I, I can remember we were in the, the room I was with, I think, three research assistants at the time, the room below us. And um, the drafts were coming and um, one of them, 
I said, well, that isn't good. And how do we mean that? And one of them, uh, an Argentinian lawyer, as it turned out, said, why are we working on this? Why don't we put all that aside and just sit here and say and write what Tuckalau wants and send it back as a counter draft? And, and that actually became the negotiated document. So it may well have ended up, it could have gone the other way, but I think that was a turning point. Well, let's not keep responding and trying to adapt a, a precedent, but let's just sit and do it our way and let them come back and say, no, no, you can't do this. Um, and th that, that was very interesting. For instance, we added um, a clause, I've forgotten which one, from the Cook Islands Centennial Declaration. And uh, then in discussion of foreign affairs, and said, what's that? Can't have that. That's impossible. And I just let them go. And then I said, well, actually, uh, it's your clause. You would have drafted it. For oh, well, we don't like it. So it went, but um, yeah, it's a curious process. So there were three documents, and um, I haven't reviewed it recently, but it was basically a, a domestic constitution, the core, and it's very short, which is still there. They're still living with that without the, it's had deleted the, um, self-government bits and um, then there was a treaty with New Zealand which of course different the nearest you get to a treaty is in the New Zealand Constitution Acts for those two um, and that's not autoctony so it was a treaty and then um, then Foreign Affairs wanted as a longer document, like an explanation, um, a supplement to the Constitution, to the, sorry, to the treaty. Um, yeah, so at the, the moment of um, self-determination, um, sort of colonialism would end and then immediately there'd be assigned a treaty with the former colonial power setting up a status of free association. <laughs> That's from memory how it was worked. Yeah. Yeah, I think, um, I think that was one of the, the more creative things we did, but of course uh, it um, lost in history now. It would have been very different if if they had self-determined, because yeah. it would have been seen as a, as a model. Back home in Puerto Rico, that's one of the main concerns of some um, defenders of free association. That, or sorry, that was that's one of the main criticisms of, of people who don't want independence and may sort of want or be willing to accept free association. That they say, well, in order to enter into a, into a treaty of free association, we have to be independent first and you don't know what will happen during that period but in your in your model you are only independent for, uh, well, for one a second. second. Yes, yes. And, and of course um, uh, Puerto Rico could be a little bit different but you see the, the um, General Assembly is still heavily involved theoretically with Tokelau and they had approved this on the basis of free association so if, if uh, at that moment New Zealand said we're not signing, um, that would have been a major breach of the international understanding. So, there were, and of course New Zealand didn't, wouldn't want an independent, I'm sure wouldn't want an independent Tokelau sitting on the equator. Mm. Um, the, so it, I think it would would have suited. Um, it did suit everybody um, at the time. Um, 
the um, uh, uh, again Puerto Rico may be a bit different or may be similar but uh, there, there are thousands of Tokelauans in New Zealand in the metropole and only 1500 up there so um, they wanted the citizenship they wanted the freedom of movement um, access to education social benefits and so on here so that um, the citizenship and the links with families as with Niue and the Cook Islands is, is a major major thing so that would militate against independence um, um, as, as it does for instance in Niue but then integration Tagalao governs its own land the eldest custom um, they wouldn't and they wouldn't want to be under the New Zealand Crimes Act uh, or the the land system, um, which in integration they would, they may have a deal that that wouldn't be affected, but ultimately uh, the parliament here is the boss. So, um, so it fits. It, the the model fits nicely, and it's just a question of how. Um, how it's calibrated. Um, there's an earlier uh, sort of a preliminary document called Principles of Partnership, and um, that prepared the way for this. And I remember um, a senior official said, um, Oh, the principles of partnership, uh, which we had to negotiate. And uh, she said, um, what your, I, I, I complained because Tokelau made no commitment. And I said, these principles you've drafted looks like uh, a presumption of free association. And um, she said, no, 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 no assumptions. She said, what you're looking like looking to amend it looks like um, independence. So there were already these um, yes. difference of views several years, be well, um, uh, uh, not difference of views, but difference of um, approaches. Mm. And what I th think looking back to, to that package is, um, goodness knows what the future will be, but it's a package that would be very simply adjusted to be either integration or independence. Uh, so uh, I don't think, they wouldn't necessarily have to reinvent the wheel, although um, New Zealand may well uh, want to to reinvent the wheel. But um, at the time, as I say, with the, our counter document, we serendipitously um, managed to, to control the draft. Otherwise, it would have been a um, colonial style arrangement. I think, and I think you need something. Otherwise, it's a task, right? But I, I have enjoyed it, and um, uh, like going to Mauritius. First of all, it's curiosity, and and uh, and you know, total it's curiosity. Uh, what what goes on here? How do things work? And then. Um, coming from you know a standard legal training you've got a sense of the rule of law and whether people obey the law or not is one thing but if they don't know what the law is it's, it's quite a different one so I think if through it all you'll find access to law as a most of what I've done is providing access what people do with it 
is, an, is another question, but uh, access, yeah. Well, I'm, I'm not involved in, you know, the recent or current debates, really. Um, I've been interested in them. Back in the 90s, uh, was for one of the constitutional collections, I don't know if it was Blaustein or one of the others, um, uh, Rosemary Gordon and I put together, if, if there were a constitutional document, what it would look like. And it was just plucking the... So it was a consolidation of key clauses. So it had a view of what a constitution would have. Uh, it was just an extended statute. Um, Mauritius was an eye-opener because um, it's an entrenched constitution. What a pleasure that was. Um, a lot of your problems are answered and people come in, I want this, I want that. Um, you know, say, sorry can't do it. It's there. Um, a lot of um, sort of preliminary argy-bargy is simply out of, out of court. Um, you, you have principle and say, well, um, you, you're going to get support for a constitutional amendment? Oh, no, wouldn't you? Well, go home. Um, and the same in Solomon Islands. It's just, um, or more recently, New York. So I, I really think an entrenched constitution is, is wonderful. I'm also, um, uh, on that point, it's interesting. Um, in Mauritius, the, the emergency gave rise to a number of cases on the civil rights side, defend, detentions and so on. But the, the, key, the key litigated thing was the right to property. Um, a major, major aspect. And of course, um, our, our Bill of Rights doesn't have property in it, because it's too hard. But, um, you know, some people say, well, if you don't have property, what, the other rights are s s sort of less significant if you're survival level. Um, so, yeah, um, and, and I much prefer short and principled, so the ones, the drafts, recent drafts, they still look very like a common law statute in detail. I think, um, um, for a Japanese constitution, it works, it's not very big, it's clear statement of principle and you leave the rest to legislation. Um, I don't think, if, if the people are involved here, I don't think there'll be any change. Uh, and, uh, short of, you know, some revolutionary event, um, I don't think there'll be any change because grassroots, they, they don't know about the law. They, and what's a constitution? It's a, things are all right. Stop. You know, uh, the Bill of Rights would not have got entrenched. Uh, and I'm sure, uh, we, quite apart from the treaty, I think it'll be a wee while off to get uh, popular support. Um, the other thing, um, my preference would be to start with um, some indigenous principles like mana, utu, um, araha, and so on, and work from there rather than build on what we've got and sort of infiltrate them. I think start afresh, general principle is, but I'm not involved and don't know a lot about it, but... Um, my experience of entrenched written constitutions has been a good one. Mm. Like of codes. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> very good. Mm. Thanks very much. That was wonderful, Tony. Thanks very much. Thanks. Thank you, John.